In the autumn of 1939, I landed my first job. Here, co-starring with a celebrity of this time, Mickey Mouse. I was being influenced by a creative professional environment before I knew I was me. In the years that followed, these shoots kept on coming, and my interest in the creative process grew. This photo was shot inside, but on the cover it appeared to be outside. I do remember we were standing on orange crates, the lights were very hot, the lamb was real, and so was the girl. I thought to shoot indoors and make it look outdoors was magical. I think this was my last shoot, this ad for Shreddies. Check out this recipe. The Second World War had ended, times were changing, and I had just outgrown the wagon. When you look back and connect the dots, this experience most definitely left its imprint. At the time I first started using paper, I was painting with acrylics on border canvas. When I found myself again sitting watching a sunrise scratch on my head and asking what the hell am I doing to this picture, I recognized I needed more to begin with. Using magazine paper, I ripped out colors that I was able to use as a palette and glued them in place to create a composition. This seemed to work. I could see the dawn, but with far less confusion. This is an example of what I call rips, showing the palette and composition. So here would be an example of a rip, and this is the finished painting. This is another rip and the finished painting. This rip shows a field of wooden cows. A tourist once told me that there were so many cows in this island they must grow in trees. So I made this picture to see if wooden cows could be mistaken for real cows. Maybe he was right. Tourists are all knowing, don't you know? While looking through magazines for color, I also saw other toys I could play with. I wanted to teach myself to glue paper. Decoupage is gluing paper. Seemed like a good place to start. My first attempts were on surfaces such as this table. Here I cut out a sampling of products of the time, probably uh, the late 70s letting the random placement of objects create their own composition. Another example is this chair, with its own chaotic composition. The man who used to sit in it, as the story goes, was always in great spirits, and this chair represents this story. I also learned the glue around corners. With this bureau, I took a bit more control of the composition, using reds on the front and blues on the top to direct focus. On this screen, I took complete control of the composition, design, and color to dictate a full story. I was papering any surface I could find. Here's an example of the kitchen floor, having glued to the tile pattern that was already there. Despite the heavy traffic area, it lasted for years. Even though Mary Hartman Mary Hartman would have disapproved of its waxy yellow buildup. I even did the ceiling with large posters. This was a trial, but I finally got it flat and it did work. As a bonus, I also learned how to glue my hair. One winter, I was approached by a restaurant owner who was looking to make changes to his interior decor. My thought was, people needed a conversation, a diversion while waiting for their meals. And I had an abundance of Time magazines. He liked the direction I was taking and let me loose. 
I started by using the magazine covers as a collage, creating nine frame panels measuring 32 inches by 40 inches. Here's an example of how they joined each other, meandering down the wall for the length required to cover all the booths. Somewhere there are photos of these panels installed, but I have no idea where they are. I then used the inside stories of the magazines to create the tabletops that were corresponding to the year of the cover beside the seats. They were designed so you could read the stories from either direction. I was told that people would change sides during a meal or request upon arrival some place they had not been seated before. The ceiling was done in movie posters I had collected from a video rental store. When I was finished, there must have been over 50 panels, so even if a customer looked up, it could invoke a discussion. The other piece I installed was for kids. It was based on a game we called Closes. You would flip your card towards a wall, and the closest one would win the cards in play. It must have been enjoyed, as the staff were always cleaning off nose and fingerprints. Years later, with the selling of the restaurant, meaning new owners and new ideas, this story came to its end. I was using magazines such as Vogue or Elle, which in comparison provided a very good paper for what I was attempting. They had changed their format of advertising and started using large areas of solid color. Some were double paged and would repeat for months. I started to collect the palette. I then discovered that while the color may have looked the same, because they came off the press at different times, the gray tones altered, giving them different shades. I asked the local store owner if they could throw in some extra magazines for me when they placed their orders, knowing that copies coming off the press would be boxed together. This now gave me pages of color all of the same shade. I had put a couple of shows on in town, and when people saw what I was doing, mysterious piles of magazines started appearing on my doorstep. Sometimes I knew who left them, sometimes not. I had become a collector of magazines. This kitten also seems to enjoy my paper collecting. No wonder there's so many damn cat ears in my art. I first tried working on heavy cardboard that quickly turned to wood panels. This is a double page I selected, and this is how I applied it to the finished picture. Starting with a one-line drawing, and using a light table, I cut out this shape from magazine paper, using these forms to develop my composition. With this glued in place and a selected palette, I went at it. I start with an idea, but at some point, I let the picture tell me what it needs to finish the story. The secret is knowing when to stop. The glue used is watered down white glue, with the ratio being determined by the paper I'm using and the surface I'm gluing to. These are some examples of this technique from sometime in the 1980s.
1913, a bridge was built connecting the island to the mainland. This opened the area and its abundance of lakes to the sports fishermen. Resorts were built catering to the growth and tourism, and some of these accommodations included boats and guided excursions onto the larger water for a day of fishing. A shore dinner would be prepared at noon, including the morning's catch, along with beans, frying potatoes and bread, and a sweet for dessert. Along with shore dinner, I did two other pictures telling this story. Behold the Fisherman shows a party leaving the dock at dawn. And in this piece, a guy is amusing the guests by spinning another yarn. Shore dinner and Behold the Fisherman were both reproduced as signed limited edition prints, along with quiet bells of Barry Island. On this small island, the school and church were the center of activity. These buildings have been demolished and replaced by a modern structure. The silent bells still remain as a reminder. From the timbering and commercial fishing industries to the regular ferry service come boats of all shapes and sizes. What remain are slowly vanishing. This steel hulled tug, the Nellie Ted Purvis, was lost in the storm and now rests on the bottom of Lake Superior. Many end up in the scrapyard. This is a portrait of Humphrey May, reported to be the first white man born on the island. This is a portrait of a steam tractor, another relic from the early days of farming. The annual powwows offer the eyes a feast of shapes, vibrant colors, feathers, and fringe. Sometimes at rest, sometimes in the motion of dance. This poster was created as a memory of the Ocean House. With its loss by fire in 1977, the town lost its hub, something that's never been replaced. Later I painted this series of oils depicting the hotel's life during different aspects of the winter. This short video combines one-room schoolhouses, one of my favorite subjects, and graffiti, an art form that has always intrigued me. Graffiti has been around since Rome built walls and the people found paint. As kids, we would count the Kilroy was here burners as they appeared everywhere, soon to be painted over the nuisance they wear. The retired Brittonville schoolhouse hid this statement of time until the roof collapsed, burying its story.
In 1965, I was part of a group showing. It included this oil and four other paintings. By a stroke of luck, I had a politician disagree with my depiction, stating that poverty in the North did not exist as I had painted it. This comment gave me weeks of publicity as it was debated in the press. The painting Don't Leave came from a family I knew whose parents would leave for a Friday night party and return two weeks later. About this time, a friend of mine was working with a new painting medium called acrylics. He gave me a pile of tubes and says, see where this takes you. Four years later, I had a one-man show in the city of Toronto with the results of working with these acrylics. In this show, my figures had turned and faced me, but they were faceless, bewildered people vacantly staring into space. The show was very successful with good reviews and some avid art collectors. These black and white photos remain memories of this show. About a year later, I spent a winter in a northern cabin. I do believe it was cabin fever that drove me to take the styrofoam panels off the walls and start carving what was the insulation, as if it was battleship linoleum for a lino print. I had the opportunity to take the resulting block prints south on a series of traveling art shows, which provided enough income to construct my current home. $2,800 went a long way at that time. During a renovation years later, I discovered some discarded styrofoam and created my dancers. It just seemed like the natural thing to do. The cattle beasts I explained in track two came from approximately a year later. The green series evolved in the late 70s and early 80s. At this point in time, I seemed to be more interested in the fantasy that the island presented, trying to ignore the reality of how it was evolving. It was created with a wash and subtle glazes. This extended the lifetime of a tube of paint, which seemed important, and gave me a nice translucent story. A great majority of the pictures I've made and the stories I've told are about island life at the time I painted them. In the big sail, I've used Kagawang as the stage set, and the character's purpose is lighting a town which is normally quiet and dark at this time. These were also created with washes and glazes. With their late, I also used Kagawang as my stage, setting my characters on each side of the road in anticipation, I presume, of somebody's arrival. I left an unfinished look to this piece as the story has been left incomplete. Again created with washes and glazes, under the boardwalk investigates unforeseen light playing in the early evening, an abstraction of shapes seldom seen. The small 4x5 panels are studies of subjects, my way of investigating stories to come. I hope this track has given you some insight into the current Jack White showing at the Gore Bay Harbor Center.